And it's preparing. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Hi. Welcome to Meet and Eat Together. My name is Melissa Gerson. I'm here today with my colleague and friend, Melanie Rogers. She's the founder and executive director of Balance Treatment Center in New York City. And we're here together to enjoy a lunch meal and walk everybody through uh, a therapeutic meal in real time. So I'm looking forward to chatting with Melanie. Um, before I do so, we're going to do the setup for a therapeutic meal. So um, before, before we even get into that, uh, it's a really good opportunity if you have any friends or people in your life that you think might benefit from this conversation, uh, the structure of the meal, now might be a good time to invite folks in um, and, and share the experience. Um, so uh, we're, this is a kind of a typical structure for a treatment center therapeutic meal. We usually start with checking in on how folks are feeling at the table, both um, emotionally and physically. You know, are people feeling any connection to hunger cues? Um, are they feeling a connection to any feelings that might be impacting how, how they're gonna experience the food? So um, what we do after that, or just a very quick check-in is that we actually check in on also the food that we've brought to the table. So, um, Oftentimes in an outpatient setting, food is not actually served to, to participants, but um, the participants are invited to bring a meal and we provide some basic guidelines. And this gives an opportunity to practice plating food, choosing food, portioning food. So hopefully if you're here today, you brought a meal along with you. I'm gonna share my meal and also how I came about uh, putting my meal together and how I thought about portioning my plate uh, selecting the meal, and Melanie's going to do the same with her meal. So this kind of gives you a sense of how uh, how we might go go about meeting our needs without getting too caught up in measuring food or weighing food or um, getting too kind of um, detail oriented or specific. We're kind of working on more flexibility. So. The guidelines that we usually give are, you know, we want the meal to be balanced. We want to make sure it's adequate to meet your needs. We want to be sure to keep balance that there's a protein component, that there's a starch component, that there's adequate fat in the meal. And then along with that, there can be fruit, vegetable, if you'd like. Sometimes we work on Instead of having a side, we might work on having a dessert and kind of practicing that together with support to get a bit more comfortable expanding, expanding variety around certain food types that might be more challenging. So today I, I'm, I'm meeting all of my needs, I think. Um, well, Melanie's a dietitian, so she can tell me for sure whether I'm, 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 I'm getting what I need here. So you can see my meal. I have um, pasta with uh, bolognese sauce that I made myself. Um, which sounds really fancy, but it's basically a marinara sauce. I think it's a store-bought sauce that I, um, I spice up with some ground beef and some frozen mixed vegetables. It's super easy. It's a great kind of quarantine meal because you can use frozen vegetables. I, I think the frozen vegetables taste really good because there's corn and peas and carrots in them and it gives it a nice texture and flavor. Um, so it's the bolognese sauce on the pasta. And then I also have a little salad that I put together with what I had in the house, which is spinach leaves, tomato, and I, I like it with a little bit of sprinkled Parmesan. And then I, I covered it with some Ken's uh, bottled salad dressing that I had in the house. Um, so in terms of how I thought about this meal, this was leftover dinner from last night. So it was easy for me to just put throw it together. I didn't have a lot of time and I wanted to use the leftover. So it was easy to throw it together and warm up the pasta. Um, you know, I've gotten pretty, I've gotten kind of used to my bowls. Um, and so over time, I've gotten a sense of how high in the bowl the pasta goes in order to be a portion that kind of feels satisfying to me. So my bowl, I mean, I would say I'm about three quarters of the way full here. And I don't know, you know, is it a cup of pasta? Is it a cup and a half? I, to be honest with you, I don't know. But by looking at it, I can get a sense as I mixed it with the bolognese 
you know, I think this is going to be a good first portion. I noticed that sometimes at dinner, I'll have more. At lunch, my guess is this is going to fill me up and make me feel kind of comfortably full. Um, and then the salad, you know, I just kind of filled the plate. It's a salad plate. So I just said, okay, I'm going to throw enough, uh, enough spinach on it to, to cover the plate, to make sure that the tomatoes look colorful on top, a sprinkle of Parmesan, and then enough dressing really to coat all the leaves. That's kind of a good way of thinking about portioning the dressing. It's a full fat dressing that I'm using. Um, and I also was drawn to this meal today because it's kind of a cold day. It's a little bit gray. And so I was feeling more in, in the mood for something warm uh, as opposed to a cold lunch and something a little heavier, like the meat sauce is kind of heavier. It's something I kind of think of more as my dinner meal, but it felt like a nice kind of comforting, cozy lunch meal for me today. Um, so Melanie, hello and welcome. Hello. Nice to see you. Great to see you. And, um, maybe for a start, if you could share your meal and how you came up, how, how you came about portioning the meal, choosing the meal, it'd be really nice to hear from you, given your background, your experience, you know, how, how, how you feed yourself and, and what you think about for yourself when you're putting a meal together. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's interesting because this is, this is kind of a lunchtime go to this meal. So, which is toasted cheese sandwich with ham. Oh, nice. Oh yeah. That's beautiful. Wow. Um, that so looks like some kind of a panini maker or something yeah, along those lines. The yeah. sandwich maker that I love. And I, I think honestly, it's, it's, I used to make these when I was at college and I'd run home after my lectures and then I'd have lunch at home and I'd eat these while I was watching daytime TV. And then I'd go up and I'd spend the rest of the afternoon <laughs> studying. So I don't know why I've always loved my toasted cheese and ham sandwiches, but usually yeah. pineapple, but I ran out of pineapple. So there's no pineapple in these. So it's like ham, cheese, pineapple, Hawaiian. Nice. Well. So, um, and I know when we talk about portioning, um, I always make the two full uh, sandwiches, but I notice that some days I eat three of the triangles and other days if I'm extra hungry, I eat the four. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's really just intuitive eating and we'll, we'll kind of see how that goes. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm super hungry this morning though, so I imagine I'm going to eat all of this. Um, and then inside, um, I don't usually think about this again, but, I, but if I break it down for our viewers today, um, there's two slices of cheese um, on each piece and there's about three or four slices of ham on each piece. Mm -hmm. So, and then I, um, I put butter on the outside because that helps it to not stick and it gives it a little bit of extra um, um, really good mouth feel. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's not too dry. So I guess if we, you know, again, I'm a nutritionist, but I, I try to not think of my, my food as, as uh, in macros, like, okay, I've got the protein, I've got the carb, I've got the yeah, fat, yeah. Um, because I try to just put together meals that are enjoyable. But if we do think about that for the purposes of, of today, then I've definitely got my fat with the butter on the outside. I've definitely got protein from our cheese and and also from the um, from the ham, um, and also there's as you know um, it's a regular cheese so it's full fat component there which is great because of that satiety and then of course my carbohydrate in the bread is is all there so it's a it's a, a nicely balanced meal. Yeah, I, really, <laughs> I, think, I, I think it speaks to the satiety piece. You know, um, I think many of our viewers uh, have at some point in their lives had some anxiety or fear around certain fats like butter. So I think it's really, really meaningful. You know, you're a dietitian, you've, you've studied the human body, you've been working with eating disorders throughout your career. And, you know, in, in your practice and the way that you care for your body, butter is incorporated. And, you know, and, and for me too, you know, my, my meat sauce, I cooked the ground beef, I, I didn't pour off any oil, you know, I am, and, and that was thoughtful on my part, because I know that when I keep the, the, the fat in there, that extra fat in there, it's more satisfying for me, and I enjoy the taste more. Um, and I think, you know, especially for our patients who might struggle with restrictive tendencies that kind of also, also may shift into overeating tendencies, that that kind of under eating mentality or the restrictive mentality and the restriction in particular around fats, I think really works against people because, Absolutely. you know, it takes a much larger portion 
to satisfy you if you're not if there's not an adequate fat component and it's not going to hold you in the same way that's right i actually think that the low fat the low fat um movement you know a couple of deca decades ago and, and yeah. you know some of the diets that are out there set people up for disordered eating and overeating melissa exactly for that reason because again if this were light bread for example which is half the calories of regular bread this is regular bread um and without if it were low fat cheese and there were no butter um you know it would fill me from a volume perspective but the satiety wouldn't be there but i also know that an hour or two later i would be hungry again you know, whereas this will hold me for a good three hours, maybe four until it's snack time. Yeah, it's so interesting because it, that's so true. And I think that's something about intuitive eating, right? Yep. When, you, when you get to a place in recovery where you can have more of that um, responsive approach to your eating, where you're, if you feel hungry, you eat, you trust that you can eat when you feel hungry, you know, you begin to really notice how much satiety plays in that- yep. You know that if you eat a meal that satisfies, you're actually not even going to think about food for quite some time. That's right. You know? That's Whereas you know it's not going to even come to your mind, which is a really good thing, right? You know. Whereas yeah. if you have a meal, like if I just did the salad and some kind of light side, I know myself, I will be thinking about food in, right. in an hour. I will be thinking about food again. My body will be saying, mm, "No, that didn't work." You know, yep. so yep. I think it's just a really, it, it, you're right. I think that movement around the low fat really set people up for disordered eating. So, oh, absolutely. People ended yeah. up overeating and because you start cruising for food, you know, you're kind of going through all your cupboards looking for something. You're just looking yeah. for something because you're not satisfied. So that satiety piece is hugely important. So yeah. hugely important important yep. so thanks for reminding us of that Melanie so um what we're going to do next we checked in on our meal we are going to set an intention so you know the idea that we go into a therapeutic meal wanting you know we want to get something out of this we want to be thoughtful and practicing maybe a new skill that we we've, we've um been working on or maybe trying a new food that's a little bit more challenging or working on self-compassion or self-validation throughout the meal, you know, something on your mind, maybe thinking about pacing of the meal. Um, and so, you know, it's a good opportunity right now to just kind of think about, you know, what, what do you want to kind of focus on in this meal today? And if, if you're having a hard time thinking of something, I'll, I'll propose something. And so you can consider this this option if, if, you, if you think it'll be helpful, but I might actually suggest focusing on breathing. So the way that we would do that is that I wouldn't expect you to focus on breathing this whole time because that would be really distracting and crazy making, but maybe every once in a while. Um, so for example, I'm going to set a little alarm, a little alarm to go off in 15 minutes to let us know we're kind of halfway through the meal portion. Maybe at that moment, turn to your breath for a second. Make sure that your breath is slow and steady because that kind of puts our bodies in like a more relaxed stance. Um, and so use that as a moment to check in on your breath, you know, take a, a breath in, make sure the, the exhale is a little bit longer than the breath in that kind of slows your body down. Um, maybe take a moment right now to kind of tune into your breath to take a nice deep breath, let the air out, you know, notice how that feels in your body when you attend to the breath. Maybe when I give you the five minute alert that we have five more minutes left of the meal, take that as an opportunity again to check in on the breath. So just an idea of something to throw out there and see how it works for you. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna set a little a timer. So I'm gonna let you know when we're halfway through with the eating portion. Melanie and I are gonna eat and talk. Um, so don't mind our mouths full, <laughs> uh, no rules about that. Um, and I'll let you guys know when we have 15 minutes left of the eating portion. So, um, so Melanie, it's so good to see you. You know, you and I, when we connected before this, um, this meeting to talk about what we wanted to, to discuss during this, this, you know, live meal support, we ended up chatting about so many things and it made us realize that so many of the things that we're dealing with right now in our own lives are the things that many of the folks out there who might be tuning into this are dealing with as well. So I think it kind of inspired us to just have not a very formal structure for this conversation, but I think talking just in general about balance, you know, and, and not necessarily balance the treatment center, but 
maintenance of balance. Like how do we maintain some kind of balance right now for ourselves, you know, in terms of our relationships, our psychological health, our eating. So I think that's the broad theme. Um, you know, maybe for start for starters, if you could say a, a bit about your own personal balance right now, and also what you're hearing from your community around kind of where people are in terms of how how balanced they're feeling at this time. Yeah, absolutely. When we when we spoke, um, it was a week or so ago, and um, I think we were just. Honestly, it had been four, when we spoke, Melissa, it had been four weeks of feeling completely off balance. Yeah. And so I think that was very much the prevailing feeling of just how tiring it was every single day to not feel like yourself because you're so off balance. And, um, and I made a joke. Is it okay if I joke? Oh, um, absolutely. And swearing too. I made a joke. I have a stick show on my own. Um, and it's been tough, you know, with the homeschooling and I, uh, you know, I know that you have kids and, and a lot of people have kids at home. And so we're trying to work and do homeschooling for our kids and, and, and we're all off balance. So I was making the joke that I'm not suicidal right now, but I am homicidal where I felt like <laughs> my child. And I said that with some other friends, I was kind of like, you know, I felt terrible that I had had these thoughts of just like this is making me crazy because I love being a mom but my goodness um and and just just being willing to say that out loud you know others also joined in and we're all like yeah welcome to the club you know we're we're yeah. all that way and and so it it makes you realize just how tough this is and and so my um I think what I shared with you is I was feeling so so thrown off as we all were and also what what I think we were saying Melissa is that thank goodness right now um you know I I'm fully recovered from an eating disorder I, I have that as part of my lived history um and I'm very very recovered so I'm not struggling with that part um of something that historically I had struggled with with but it's still really hard which gave me the empathy empathy to think that for our clients who still don't have um, all of their different coping mechanisms figured out and, you know, they don't have that benefit of years of recovery under their belt to build up their confidence, um, just how much more difficult it must be for them as well, you know? So, so there's a lot of empathy that I'm feeling there for our clients because if we're feeling this bad, then we know our clients are feeling even worse. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, it's just like God awful, honestly. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I was also feeling very, very overwhelmed with all of the news um, and feeling also in those first four weeks, I think we were feeling because I own a business and I have, you know, a whole staff as you do to take care of and be abreast of the news. So I felt an obligation to stay tuned in with the news um, and it was wearing me down. Um, and so once we kind of got through that for first four weeks and the reporting was then more about, okay, guys, let's just stay the course, it's shelter in place. Mm -hmm. And there weren't re really any more updates from a regulation perspective. It was more just let's stay the course. I unplugged. My video just stopped there. Um, I unplugged from the news because I noticed just how badly it was making me feel each day. And also we were joking as well about there were just so many well-intentioned emails coming out about take this time to write some kind of noble, noble prize winning book or, you know, <laughs> learn a yeah. yoga practice or do this or do that. You know, there was just so much pressure about use this time well. And, and honestly, I mean, I was just finding I was just struggling to get through the day and keep my head on, you know. So I also made a decision at that time that this is not helpful for me putting this extra pressure on myself. I have to scale back. I have to scale back because I'm going to, I have to keep my sanity because this is for the long haul. And yeah. we, at that point, we're only halfway through. So we're about, you know, we've still got at least another four plus weeks to go. So I need to think about this as a marathon and not a sprint. Yeah. And how do I do that? I can't keep going at the pace that I'm going at feeling so off balance where I can't be a good mum when yeah. I'm so off yeah. balance. Yeah. And yeah. it's really hard to be there for my clients 
in a heart and soul way that I like to be there for them and certainly to have compassion and empathy and support for my staff and just the energy to get through the day, right? Yeah. So I made the decision then that I was going to unplug from a lot of these should be doing this and should be doing that. Yeah, and should a lot of shoulds and, and, oh. and suggestions, yeah. Yeah. All the foods, Melissa. So I'm, I'm really hungry. I'm going to take a bite. Um, so excuse me as I eat with my mouth full. Yeah, um, but all the shoulds. So so I, I broke it down to three things and I shared with you, you this with you that yeah. I came up with a mantra of, okay, what do I absolutely have to focus on? So the three S's, which were um, staying safe. Obviously, we need to stay safe. Staying sane, whatever that meant. meant <laughs> right? And so for me, it was unplugging from the news and just saying anything that has a should attached to it, I'm just, that's a red flag right now. Yeah, yeah. Serve energy, right, which is about saying sane. Um, and, you know, having ha establishing your routine. So I get up, I make my bed, I make sure I jump in, in the shower because, and having my coffee, my breakfast, doing those three or four things, yeah. set me up for the day. Yeah, so that's yeah. Really helpful with the sanity piece. And then, honestly, it can all fall apart. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. At least I've made a good a good attempt yeah. at starting the day well. Um, and then the last one was staying sober. So safe, sane and sober. And sober can be whatever, whatever sober means to you. So sober for our clients, meaning not using symptoms. Uh, sober in my case, meaning that I love my wine, but just knowing that this is a time where you can really be drinking a lot. Yeah, uh, yeah as in drinking every day because you just feel like you need a glass of wine at the yeah. end of the day. Yeah. And I was thinking, um, I, I don't want to do anything that's going to make me feel worse and make me even feel more tired and off balance than I already am. Yeah. So, so for me, that meant making sure I get to bed early and, and also not drinking at all right now. So I, I have my lovely tea. Yeah. Um, because I'm, yeah, so um, I don't know if that's that's too much information, but no, really, I, I guess what I'm trying to share is what am I doing that I know is helpful for me and supportive for me and what do I, I know could be unhelpful? So cut that out. Yeah, I think that, um, I think there's like so many wise things that you're sharing right now. And I think one of the things I'm hearing is that, like I also um, was overwhelmed with all the to-dos and the shoulds and the suggestions, you know, so for example, suggestions about, you know, how to raise your children under quarantine and, you know, these incredible schedules that people were doing. And I, I had a lot of feeling inadequate because I would see these incredible things that other moms were posting about, you know, resources that they've come across or this video or this homeschool thing. And so I think, you know, one thing I'm really connecting with about what you're saying is just how bombarded we are with mo like these models of how we need to be right now and how we need to perform right now and how hard that is. And then I think what I'm also hearing from you is that what you've established is that for you, you've noticed that there are a few things that you can do that feel helpful to you. And the things that you can do that feel helpful to you are probably different than the things that feel helpful to me or that might feel helpful to somebody else. Mm -hmm. So I think there's no one model or one way to quarantine, but really so much I think is just that, like taking that reflection or that moment in the day to think, well, you know what, this morning went a little better. Why is that, you know? Right. You know, and, and maybe just translating that into eating, you know, to, yesterday was a better eating day. It was within my control to um, help me with my life right now. Um, and so I think I think that you know that reflection and that really like really it's about you and what works for you. Um, and then there was one other thing that you said too that I, I think is so huge right now. You mentioned you know having a conversation with other other people who were kind of sharing how hard it was for them too and i think i felt this in my conversation with you last week where i was just like yeah melanie like it's a nightmare around here you know my kids are you know out of control and you know i was just you know like um, killing each other and you know it just feels so good when you can connect with somebody and not comparing yourself to the model on TV or the model on Instagram or the model in Facebook of 
what everybody's doing, but to a real live person and just being open to sharing your own experience, which is messy. You know, and I think I also felt safer doing that because you felt safe doing it. Like we we were able to just feel safe talking about how imperfect things were for us recently. And, and that was really comforting, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. And and hopefully what we're trying to model also is that it has to be real. Yeah. Yeah. For you to feel for you to conserve your and to be to for you to kind of be able to um, keep your pace during the day, for you to be able to show up for your kids in the way that you want to show up for them, which means, you know, not going off the you know, flying off the hand yeah. handle yeah. every three seconds. Which when, when we're really stressed, it really challenges you in that way, you know. Um, and and the fact that yeah, it's so not perfect, and and yet you still just well, you all you can do is control what you can control. Like yeah. I can control yeah. what time I go to bed. So, so therefore, at, at the very least, I can control um, to some extent how much sleep I'm getting, and I can control. Um, getting up in the morning and making my bed and having my breakfast and having a shower. And then I, I kind of feel put together for the day. Like, and that gives me a good start point. So I can control that. That's within my control. Yeah. I and mean, how the day plans out, I have no control over. And so, you know, <laughs> yeah. but, but so I guess it's really those small triumphs. Um, and as you said, Melissa, figuring out what works for you and for it to feel real and reasonable and and most importantly can I get up every single morning and make my bed and get in the shower and have breakfast or is that too much and if it's too much um maybe not make the bed and because maybe it doesn't make you feel good but every single time I walk through my bedroom because I yeah. live in an apartment here yeah. in New York, so I walk past my bed a lot every single time I see my bed nicely made it makes me feel oh yeah like I'm impacted yeah. by my yeah. my environment yeah. So it's a mental thing as well. Um, but, but these small observations, I think, are very important and very powerful at this time of quarantine because they do affect how you then feel and therefore what you can then expect of yourself as far as how you're getting through the day. Yeah. And certainly trying to minimise the things that suck your energy, make you feel distressed, make you feel even worse about yourself. Um, and honestly, also, we have to remember that there are going to be some days where getting up and, and having a shower, making your bed are just all too much. And mm -hmm. so, you know what? That's also okay. Yeah. You yeah. Know? So, yeah. um, I say that hoping that, you know, for some of the people who might be listening to this or watch this, um, at some other time also realize that it's absolutely okay to just give yourself a break, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, without question. Um, you know, it's funny. I found myself over this quarantine repeating um, this one phrase a lot, which is, I, I kind of call it a skill. It, it comes from DBT, you know, dialectical behavior th therapy. And I think a lot of times, oh, it's the 15 minute. And so if anyone wants to take a breath, oh. <laughs> just slow down a little bit for a moment, you know. Not a bad idea. Um, so I'm going to let everybody know when we have, in 10 minutes, I'll let you know that we have five more minutes for the eating portion. Um, but I keep telling myself, try not to make a bad situation worse. Mm. And so I'm noticing, I mean, it can definitely, it's, it's something that can come up a lot interpersonally. So for example, if you're, you know, if you're, you know, in a bad moment with another person in a, you know, having a struggle with another person and there's conflict, you know, it's such a, it's, I find it so helpful to say like, this is, this is rough. This is not great. I really don't want to make it worse. Um, so it can come up there. It can come up with, I mean, definitely for, for people around eat, like eating, eating difficulties. So for example, someone kind of going to, you know, feeling, experiencing a perceived error or mistake in eating, like I overate on something and that can often spiral into, I'm going to just keep going. It's, it's, it, I, you know, it, it, I messed up already, so I might as well. And so, you know, that idea in that moment to think, you know, I don't have to make a bad situation worse. I'm going to try actually 
I'm going to try to kind of salvage the situation in the moment. And, and that's, a, that's a, you know, that's a really good example. You know, I, I have this example with my kids, you know, sometimes when I'm noticing lately, when they're kind of out of control, they're, they're cooped up and they're misbehaving. And I, I notice when I make a bad situation worse, like I notice there are certain things that I can do sometimes that even like provoke them, you know? So for example, if I raise my voice, I think it provokes them or I notice if I threaten punishment, sometimes it actually provokes them. Yeah. And so, you know, I've, I've found that helpful sometimes to be like, okay, it's a bad situation right now. How can I not make it worse? You know, not even how can I fix it or, but how can I just not further drive it into the ground? And I think what ends up happening is what I've noticed is that then my behavior actually tends to be behavior that I can feel good about. Mm. So when it's a bad situation with my kids and I, feel like just losing it on them, which sometimes I will, you know, raise my voice and, you know, I get petty and I can be, you know, I can just make it really just like the exchange. I'm, you know, I know when I'm not taking the high road with them because I'm frustrated, but I notice when I, when I focus more on, I want to feel good about how I'm interacting in this moment. I want to walk away, just not feeling regret about how I handled this. I just, I noticed that even though the situation was bad, I didn't make it worse. And I actually leave the situation kind of with a momentary, like feeling good about myself or something I did. So I've just noticed that theme throughout, you know, just trying to balance that, you know, at times going with a feeling and the feeling may be a, a difficult feeling. And then sometimes you just, your behaviors just are not, you don't feel great about but I also noticed like go, go, approaching a hard situation and actually finding a way to make it more positive or just at least feel good about the way that I'm managing it. I think, um, I think that's a really good question to ask yourself. Melissa, I'm taking notes mentally. Yeah, yeah. Um, because it also, it also takes some of the pressure off with um, what is the ideal way to discipline my child right now? Yeah. And what should I be doing? You know, and there's a lot of pressure we put on ourselves in that respect or the ideal way to manage this conversation mm -hmm. of having with an adult or whatever. I love it because it's, it's, it's to the point. It's, it's a, it's a good outcome and you don't leave the outcome feeling worse about yourself. Um, yeah just taxing and exhausting. And for some of our people, um, our viewers who might be watching, that bad feeling that we have after such an encounter can also lead us to then self-soothe in other ways, which yeah. might be through our eating disorder or for some people with alcohol or both. Um, so I think that's a really, really cut to the chase, easy thing to, to remember as far as a skill. Yeah. I think that's a really, that's a really good one. And it, it brings to mind many embarrassing moments over the last few weeks of yeah yelling, you know with with my daughter or as you said not always taking the high road because you've been provoked but you've not just been provoked once you've been provoked all day and you get to your yeah break. yeah, you know, yeah. And then you're like oh gosh this sucks i'm a terrible parent right now yeah am i scarring my child for life you know these things go through your head right oh absolutely yeah oh. You know, so I think that's a really great thing to ask yourself. How can I not make this situation worse? And you know what else I think it can also be, how do I, you know, it's a hard situation. Let me just not make it worse. But yeah. also like sometimes we get so caught up that there's a right or wrong thing to do, but to think about how can I maintain and even like build my self-respect? So however, whatever is in my control in this moment, I can't control anything else, but what action can I take that will actually build my self-respect, that will give me a momentary, you did a good job under a bad situation, you know? And that I think can be really powerful. And, and, and it's like, there's the silver lining because then every, every negative experience, there can almost be this positive outcome where you say it was hard, but I mean, you know, I felt good about how I problem solved in that moment. I feel good about how I, dealt with it in that moment. Um, you know, there's always like this silver lining then in a rough situation. Yeah. You know, for whatever reason lately, yeah, I just, I'm really connecting with that because there's so, yeah, there's so much difficulty 
right now, both for us and outside of us. And, you know, even, you know, when you're seeing someone else's suffering, you know, is there a way of interacting with, with that experience in a way that builds your self-respect, you know, by yeah. maybe doing, you know, doing something that's helpful or showing empathy or showing support for someone else's difficulty. I don't know. I think those are, those are self-esteem moments. Those are real genuine moments to build self-esteem and and that you know that's really like that's how we work on self-esteem right you know self-esteem exactly. is not some button you turn on and suddenly you have good self-esteem I and mean, we build self-esteem through it little experiences that build up that give us a sense of a value in ourselves so I think we can build self-esteem in really hard times in really hard situations yeah oh, so, such a beautiful example there Melissa because that was exactly the word that was coming up for me as you were talking about the silver lining with those difficult situations is that's self-esteem building and that's self-confidence building um, which is how we develop um, a, a better sense of ourselves and also we hopefully develop a genuine like and respect for ourselves yeah you know which is you know the beauty of of um these kind of challenges and and behaving in the, these ways that leave us feeling better about ourselves over time what that generates is a lovely repertoire of data if you will yeah. where <clears throat> you know that gee when that really sucked and that was a really really hard time this is how i behaved that that says something about me that that says something about who i am as a person and that's the beautiful stuff that we get to develop over time um, that hopefully leads to a place where we like ourselves and respect ourselves as, as yeah. people, you know, and that self-esteem and self-confidence. And that stuff is priceless. Um, it really is because that's where you get to feel um, better about yourself just in your own presence yeah. And you have quiet time with yourself. You don't have all these thoughts and judgments going on. Um, and you feel more at ease with yourself as a person. Um, and, and, and as you rightly expressed, it's, it's a lot of those little um, challenges that give us an opportunity to kind of choose how we're going to respond um, that then help us to build a sense of who we are, you know. Which is and interesting. Oh, sorry. Yeah. And as we said earlier, I mean, there are times when we're absolutely not doing it the way that we yeah. would be doing it. Yeah. And that's a good red flag because then you're like, oh, I feel badly about yeah. the way I handle that. So you yeah. know yourself next time, how can I do it differently? It doesn't have to be perfect, just a little different to if I do it this way, I don't feel great. So how about I try yeah. it this way, you know? I Sorry, go ahead. You had some I think comments. I note that like all of these moments can be tiny little things and there's always another opportunity. So, I mean, even just thinking about eating, you know, we eat so many times a day, so many times a week, right? So, you know, every time, like, so for folks out there who might be struggling with their eating, you know, every meal is an opportunity to maybe reinforce your confidence that you took a recovery oriented step. Mm -hmm. You did something that you felt good about that was in line with your values of what's important to you right now. And so just imagine, because there were so many opportunities to eat in the day, if you can begin to kind of focus on those moments where you're taking a value-oriented, a recovery-oriented step that you did something that you felt good about because you know it was in line with, you know, being healthier and more stable in your eating, you know, you know, after a couple of days where you can, you have a little repertory, you know, you have a well that you're kind of filling with more and more, you know, positive moments of, recognition of, of doing something hard of showing strength or showing perseverance or showing courage or whatever it is you know that built that begins to build up and I think that starts to be recovery I mean that's what recovery kind of looks like so yeah. I think we can think about this very concretely as an like a, um, a strategy within an eating disorder is to try to increase experiences of 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 reinforcing your self-esteem through accomplishing what you set out to do, you know, to, you know, taking the high road, whatever that means to you in a moment. Um, and that you just keep repeating and repeating and building more and more of those positive experiences. And before you know it, you're, you're on the pathway to higher, you know, better self-esteem, recovery, um, improved relationships, whatever it may be. And so, 
I forgot to mention that we have about five more minutes of the eat, of the eating portion and maybe a good time for us to take a breath. Yeah. Um, I wanted to, you know, when we spoke last week, Melanie, we were also talking about something that I think is worth, you know, re-engaging right now about how, because of the quarantine and how, how isolated we are, how much we're missing out on reinforcement in the day or input in the day of little things in our lives that fuel us and make us feel better. So for example, you know, now you can't even walk outside and exchange a hello with people or a smile with a stranger, or, you know, I'm missing, I, I would always walk to work in the morning. And that was kind of my time to decompress and to have, you know, to catch up on a few phone calls and you know, just be outside and I'm not doing that. So, you know, or for me, even, you know, I love going to the grocery store. I know that sounds kind of weird, but I really enjoy it. It's, you yeah. know, kids behind, it's just me, I'm alone and I'm, you know, and now it's such a terrifying, you know, it's such a stressful thing to go to the grocery yeah. store. So I, you know, we were talking about how little we're get, how little, how few kind of breaks or fuel we're getting from our environment under these circumstances. Yeah, absolutely. You know, those little, we were, absolutely, we were talking about the little pleasure moments that kind of um, refresh you each day, you will replenish you. Um, and that our lives for those first four weeks were completely devoid of that. And so we were talking about just, hence we were talking about the fatigue of you know, doing a lot of Zoom, um, the fatigue oh, yeah. of the uncertain times, the fatigue of having kids at home and trying to take care of them as well as ourselves, all of those factors. Um, <clears throat> but uh, um, I, I just lost my train of thought there. But, um, but, but we were talking about how the walk in the park on the way to work or whatever just is a little, a little something that lifts us up, an uplifter, you know, and I was feeling really flat in those first four weeks because there just was nothing that was making me feel energized in a way that I like to feel energized and in balance and, you know, some creative stimulus and then, you know, the logical stuff or whatever it might be in our work day. Um, but you know, what I did start to do, um, Melissa, since then, and I was honestly, I, I'm going to be very honest here, I was so relieved because, and now when I look back on when we spoke about this last week, I realised that how I feel this week compared to last week, I think all of us, I've spoken to a number of people, had like a low-grade depression in those mm -hmm. first Yeah, yeah. Weeks. We were just low-grade, which means that things that I could normally do, like reading a book or you know, a really good book um, or, or whatever, um, things were just not interesting me to even bother doing them. You know, I, I like to organise things. So the idea of getting into my closet and cleaning it out and organising it is something that makes me kind of get excited about. Uh -huh. And I just couldn't Sharing even... Sharing that bothered. so openly. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't even be bothered doing that. Yeah. So that's what I knew there was a problem. I like not just in reading a book not into, even going out was like whatever so but since absolutely and and so therefore again when we think about the sustainability of this um i was kind of concerned that oh my gosh i'm going to feel this way for the next four six eight weeks and i just have to adjust to this horrible feeling of not feeling excitement when i get up in the day and in fact it was so noteworthy that I was feeling dread each day in the sense of, oh God, how am I going to get through the day? Yeah. You know, like it's only two o'clock. What am I going to do for the rest of the day? And I found myself in front of the TV a lot of the time because I had no energy to do anything else. Yeah. Um, and it was just a distraction that just I could, you know, tolerate. But I found, I found with some relief that maybe it was the four or five week mark here in New York City and some of my friends and colleagues have reported this as well. Something started to shift, and it may be because we're, we've re-established a new equilibrium. Yeah. Um, that things that previously would give me pleasure that are inside my home are giving me pleasure again. Um, some things. So honestly, it was kind of a relief. And, and it, the contrast is so stark that I realised that that first four weeks really was a low-grade kind of depressed mood for many of us. Um, because it's not like anything has really changed. I think it's really just 
our mental process and settling into a new reality, which we've heard a lot of people talk about, but it's really interesting when you're observing your own behaviors and yeah. for yourself. I hear you. I mean, I wonder if part of it is just getting uh, almost um, more comfortable in a way with the uncertainty because there's so much uncertainty about all of this. And maybe there, maybe something in your process was about just coming to terms with that and, you know, maybe getting more comfortable with it or maybe also getting into some kind of a groove. You know, you everybody's falling into some kind of routine. Um, even yeah. if the routine is that it's, er, there, you know, the day is erratic and disorganized, you know, you kind of know <laughs> that that's gonna be your routine. So, um, yeah, so I, I, I can connect with that. I think what I notice sometimes is, you know, at this stage, whatever it is now, five weeks in, you know, sometimes I get caught up with like, oh my God, we're gonna have weeks more just like this, you know, where one day bleeds into the next. And so I'll notice becoming a little bit overwhelmed with that. And, um, but then finding it helps to take one day, you know, I think that idea of one day at a time is very helpful. So helpful to me, I, I know, because the second I start to think about how one day is going to bleed into the next, I just have to say immediately, like, just focus on today. Don't don't think about tomorrow because. And that's yeah. a coping school right there, Melissa. Yeah. That's a coping yeah. school right there, actually, is because I know when I was younger, I, I don't feel I had. I don't think I knew how to do that, how to compartmentalize. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that was also part of overwhelm and anxiety. And when we're younger, we also put a lot more pressure on ourselves because we think we should and we have to. Yeah. And so I think this is also a part of just knowing that um, it's not helpful to think more than one day ahead. So to the best of your ability, when you catch yourself going there, just kind of pull yourself back, which is part of meditation and mindfulness, right? Um, and I, I think that that's really good. One thing I noticed that might be helpful is um, I, it suddenly occurred to me this week that with all of this, oh, my God, it's so hard to have a kid at home while you're trying to work and homeschool is hard, yada, yada. I also realized that the flip side of that is, gosh, I love not having to rush in the morning to get oh, my yeah, daughter out the door for school. Totally. So then I was like, oh, <laughs> there's some, some other things in my right? life. <laughs> yeah. It's so true. Which was really helpful to think about. So now I'm kind of looking at it like, yes, when we do go back, whenever that might be, that's something that I really don't like about about the school year. And well, I so agree. And you know, it's funny. I, I think some of us, myself included, in a way, almost have some anxiety about the idea of going back to life because I can't even imagine, first of all, what it's like to go near people you know, what it's like to hug or shake someone's hand or be able to, you know, have a chat with somebody in the street, you know, within a few a foot of each one another, or, you know, I think probably a lot of people who are watching this, people who struggle with, with disordered eating and weight concerns, you know, there's a lot of concern about like being seen again, putting on clothing, you know, um, you know, yeah, getting dressed, getting dressed up, you know, there's a way right now that there's, like, we can all kind of hide in a, in a way. I mean, you know, most days, I mean, I, I don't even know that I get dressed from the bottom down. I mean, half the times I'm, I mean, right now I'm like wearing what I slept in on the bottom. So, you know what I mean? Like, but I, I'm feeling anxious, you know, getting dressed for work, how weird that would be and to be seen and to be in a, you know, so I think that's also, Maybe another an opportunity even for me to take my breaths right now as I'm thinking about it because I I feel a little bit of anxiety about that and I think that that's going to be, you know, fortunately in a way our moving movement back into society society will be slow because it needs to be for containment of the virus but I think that'll be helpful for all of us also because it's going to feel very strange to get back to any kind of normalcy. I agree. And, and, and part of what we've been talking about today about establishing a new normal now, a new equilibrium, it makes me feel anxious about, about, yeah, breaking up this pattern now. And then I know that's going to be more hectic again. So a whole other adjustment period yeah. and, you know, trying to find the energy to kind of do that. So I totally agree with you there. Yeah. It, it definitely 
fills me with some kind of anxiety about what that's going to look like. So again, what I'm trying to do there, and I'm sure you are as well, is I'm not spending a lot of time thinking about it right now. I'm, I'm, I'm collecting the, the information I need from the news as far as what I need to do for my team and my business and also my daughter with school. And then I'm just... Um, I'm, I'm just thinking, okay, well, we were able to do a hybrid situation to where we are now. So yeah. we'll probably do a hybrid situation back um, and just allow for the messiness again, you know. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I, we are creatures of habit. I've heard that expression before. Yeah. <laughs> oh, without question. You know, <laughs> and as much as we don't like this new reality, it still is a new reality, you know. And so there's going to be a, 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 an amount of energy we're going to have to expend to kind of, you know, break out of this new norm and into a new one, you know, another and, one. I mean, we're all in this together. I mean, I think that this is global. This is, there's, you know, no one untouched by this. Um, and so we really are all in this together. Every, you know, everybody on earth right now is struggling through and, there are probably many universal experiences that we're all having. Yes. Um, and so I think we should take comfort in that, that there are many, many others who are having the same thoughts and worries and challenges as we are. And some many more and some many less. Um, so I'm gonna take just a quick moment because you know, we, we took about 30 minutes for the eating portion. Melanie, I don't know if you were able to finish because you were, you, were, you were doing maybe more talking than me. I, I did manage to finish my meal. So, um, you know, in a, in a therapeutic meal, in a treatment setting, after we complete the meal, we do check in. We want to hear, you know, how people are feeling both emotionally and physically. Um, so I'm going to share. I mean, I felt I really enjoyed my meal. Um, even though I was talking, I still was able to attend to it a little bit. And um, I felt like it was just the right amount. I feel very comfortable. Um, I feel satiated. I don't feel overly full. Uh, I, I, I'm not, you know, oftentimes when I finish a meal, it's interesting. A lot of times when I finish a meal, I crave something sweet at the very end. Um, but today I'm not. And I'm just wondering if maybe there was something to the, the warmth and the, maybe the density of my meal that just really truly left me feeling very, very satisfied. Um, maybe because there were multiple fat components. It was just, I think it was just a very balanced, like hearty meal and I feel really good. Um, so, uh, and so oftentimes we'll, Melanie, were you able to complete or maybe not, or maybe you, you know, didn't, I can't tell. Um, I, as I said, I usually have three of those four triangles yeah. and today I, I, um, I got through two and a half, two and three quarters actually, which, um, which kind of surprised me that I didn't finish the third one completely. But I did notice, I know in myself, when I start to get full, I have I have a moment where I kind of have this sigh, yeah. which tells me I'm getting close to fullness. So honestly, a, a, out of respect for intuitive eating, I'm not going to push it, but I am going to put some glad wrap over it because I know that yeah. maybe I will get hungry uh, a little bit earlier than I usually do this afternoon. Um, and it may be because we were talking a lot and such, so therefore yeah. you know, my normal eating style was was a little different um so not a judgment attached to that but just more um an observation i think you you remind me of something that i think is so important that you know by putting the glad wrap over the top what you're sh what you're reminding yourself is that when you get hungry again there is food for you that you will have you don't have to finish it now because you know it's there for you later and um, and you know that if you're hungry, you're going to eat. And I think that is a trust that, that um, has to be developed in, in the mind and in the body of people who are in recovery, because so often restriction is around the corner. And, and I, I think that that faith, that trust, that knowing when I get hungry, I will absolutely eat. That's the fuel to be able to eat intuitively. That's how you're able to feel feel comfortably full and stop eating because you know for sure if you're hungry again you're going to be able to eat so i think I'm, I'm glad that came up so that we could focus on it um, for a moment the other thing i want to say is that in a therapeutic meal often actually at the end after we check in on how people are feeling we move on immediately because um we don't through our experience over all these years we realize that the more people focus on how they're feeling after a meal, the more distressed they become or the more stressed they become if there's any conflict around eating. And of course, 
in the midst of an eating disorder, there's a lot of conflict around eating. So what we really do is we do a quick check-in how you're feeling, but then we immediately move to an action plan. We're immediately thinking about how do we move on? How do we put the meal behind you and just stay present and move on to the next thing? So oftentimes we're using a skill, we're teaching a skill, or what we'll do is even what we call a cope ahead plan, which is you know, thinking step-by-step step what's gonna happen from meal until your next eating experience. And how do you wanna prepare for that uh, so that you're sure that you're going to meet your needs and you're going to stay on track in terms of a commitment to regular eating. So in light of that, if, if anyone out there is, is interested in trying this, um, it might not be a bad idea to take out a, a piece of paper and a pencil and kind of walk through the next four or five hours. What are you gonna do next? How are you gonna distract yourself if you have thoughts intruding, worry thoughts or shame or guilt or any thoughts? You know, is there something specifically that you're gonna think about? You know, be prepared with it. Like, you know, I know when I have a negative thought, I'm gonna think about the book I'm reading. I'm gonna immediately think about the book I'm reading or I'm gonna think about something at work that I need to, you know, focus on or, you know, so be really prepared. How are you gonna manage negative thoughts? Because those are the things that tend to derail. Um, is your next meal ready? Do you know, you know wh where you're gonna be able to get it? Will it be available to you? Do you know how, how are you gonna know when it's time to eat it? You know, are you working on responsiveness to hunger cues or are you working more in a kind of in a more of a mechanical way like where you know you, know you wanna eat again in three hours? Um, so really planning that out and even thinking to yourself, what are some things that are gonna get in my way? You know, poke some holes in your plan and see if you can think about um, how you're gonna, how you're gonna manage uh, through those, those challenges. Uh, so, you know, if you're doing that on your own, essentially you're doing kind of what we do in a, in a treatment setting. And sometimes we'll teach a new skill. You know, there's, we have endless skills, um, you know, meet and eat together, this um, series that we've put together we now, it's amazing. I think we have something like 12, thir maybe 14, 13, 14 episodes. So if you would like to use them, they're free, they're accessible. Go to my3square.com, go to the live, um, the live uh, page and you know decide if you wanna use one for, for dinner tonight or use one for lunch tomorrow. And in every single session, we teach a skill. So it's an opportunity to just increase your skillfulness and learn some new strategies um, and give yourself a little bit more structure around mealtime. Uh, so Melanie, it was so nice to talk to you. I'm glad I got to actually see you. I hope to see you in the flesh sooner rather than later. Exactly. Likewise, Mr. Absolutely my pleasure. That was fun to be eating my lunch with someone. I'm usually here on my own. So yeah. that was really great. And I just hope you can stay as balanced as possible in the coming days and be easy on yourself. You're, you're doing a great, you're doing so much, Melanie. So. <laughs> Thanks, Melissa, you too, you too. Thanks a million and goodbye everybody. Bye.